Well, hi, Jerry. Thank you for joining me today. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do? Absolutely. My name is Charity Majors. I'm an operations engineer. Um, I've worked on systems, Parse, uh, Facebook, etc. And now I'm the co-founder of and CTO of Honeycomb.io, where we work on observability tools. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you joining me today to chat a little bit about cloud and observability and things like that. So first, I just wanted to ask you, why do you see companies in the first place even use cloud infrastructure for more than one provider? Why, why do that? Why do that? Well, because not everybody, not every provider is great at, at, at the same thing. Some providers are better at different things, you know, and we live in this glorious age of infrastructure where you get to pick and choose. So, you know, it, there's very little pen penalty to going to the best provider to do the best thing. As you've looked at what you've done with Honeycomb, I mean, what have you learned from building software that doesn't just run in one place? Of course, you run all over the place. It's great. So have you learned something that maybe somebody who's looking at building stuff that has to run in different places can take a lesson from you? Yeah, absolutely. If you don't have to, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you could build your systems, if you could deliver to your customers what you want to deliver to them using a LAMP stack, by God, please do it. If you do it on a single cloud service, by God, please do it. The problem is that for many of us, we can't actually build what we want to build by, you know, following those very simple and tried and true paradigms. So, you know, keep it as simple as you possibly can is, is usually my, my best advice to people. Has there been anything that's been particularly hard about it that when you looked at having Honeycomb work across different public clouds, on-prem, whatever, all these different environments, you're like, oof, like the networking or the storage or some, uh, some other, other aspect was always harder than you thought? Yeah, it's always hard, uh, which is why we keep kicking that that football, baseball, I don't know. We keep kicking some ball down the road as far as we can. Yeah, but we look for every excuse not to um, go multi-cloud, multi-region, multi-everything. Um, you know, we, we came up with a... Uh, security product. Everybody wants to have their data live in their own on-premises, and and yet they want the power and delight of SaaS, right? So we came up with a with a really cool hybrid product that would let you know let you run using the using the SaaS solution, but streaming all of your data through a proxy that you run within your network, whatever whatever that is, and just you know generates the the hash of each event and then forwards on the hash or forwards on the encrypted version of the event, but keeps the keys there on premises. We never get the keys. We can never decrypt it. So it's a nice little hybrid way of like trying to fulfill all those constraints. That said, it only works for so long. And we are looking at having to spin up, you know, in a EU site in the next year or so. So, you know, it's <laughs> don't do it until you have to. Don't do it until lots of people with lots of money are saying, yes, we want this. Now, that's good advice. To me, one of the worst ticket calls you can get to the help desk is something is slow. It's like, yeah. oh gosh, where, where do I even go with this stuff? So when you start looking at systems, either where they span on-prem and cloud or even different clouds, like, especially, I mean, give us a little bit of a lesson on observability, I guess. But where do you start? I'm assuming from what I read from you, it's not just staring at static dashboards. Yeah. No, no, that that's not going to get you very far. Yeah. And like Liz Fong Jones likes to say, that look, slow is the new down. We've gotten so good at creating these resilient systems. They rarely go down for customers, but they do get slow and that's just as frustrating. Well, first of all, I think that observability is in large part, it's not about debugging your code, right? It's not about you know fixing the code itself, but it's in a large part about finding where in the system is the code that you need to debug, right? Which means that you need to be part of observability, I think is that you collect your telemetry in a way such that you get one event per request per service. Um, and then you can populate those events with like as many details as you want or but like having one request one event per request per service allows you to correlate all kinds of things um you know from request to request while keeping that you know unique, unique request id unique trace id span ids etc um it's it's interesting something that a lot of newbies to observability do is um they will only put observability on their on their edge on their um, their web tier basically using HAProxy or Nginx or whatever. Um, but as long as they add these headers to every service that's behind behind the web tier that that take, keep track of like how long this how long this it took to call the the other service, and as long as they print those values out and then surface them in the, the log on the edge, you can actually get an entire map of your entire infrastructure and you can pinpoint, oh, that's where the slow thing is. Oh, that's where the slow node is. That's where, you know, and that's that's just so cool. 
um, you're not going to find these these problems of slowness unless you're really keeping track of, you know, the edges, the the borders between services every time you're calling out HTTP or SQL or anything else. But that, that boundary is super important. Hmm. That's really insightful. Do you, does that get harder? Is it just different when those boundaries represent cloud API gateways and they represent, gosh, I'm exiting a VPC in this cloud and that cloud? Is it just if I generate the data, then this shouldn't be rocket science regardless of where my stuff sits? Basically true. As long as you can instrument the code, like there is kind of a bright line between code you can instrument and code that you can't, right? If, there, if it's code that you can't instrument, then you're reliant on whatever they're sending back to you. Um, so for like for like databases, you know, if we're not if you're not Google, you don't get to go in and instrument your database to like, you know, add a span there, add a add something there. You've got to treat it like a black box. So some ways that we can approximate having instrumented it are, you know, we could do a TCP dump and stream all of the network traffic and reconstitute those events. We can tail dash up, you know, the the MySQL log to get the errors out, and we can connect via the console to dump out all the internal statistics every couple of seconds. That gives you a pretty good view of what's going on inside your database, even though you're not able to instrument it. Or if you've got like serverless stuff. Serverless is actually, I think, it's kind of how I tell people, think about serverless when you're instrumenting it for your, for your software, because you never assume that you have access to hardware, right? You, but you but you can still get really interesting stuff out of it as long as you're, you're instrumenting it well. Of course, when it's code that you write yourself, <laughs> you're in luck, you can do whatever the hell you want. When it's remote APIs, do you have the ability to instrument? Do you not? If, if not, you have to treat them like a black box and just track the amount of time that they spend running and then what they give you back. That's all you can do. So they're really just those 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 three categories, right? You can't do anything, so just track, track it in and out. You could do something, you know, to approximate instrumentation and then you could instrument the hell out of it. Hmm. I like all of those, all right. So are there cases where you've seen where using I, I to your point I, I like hey if you just pick one cloud please pick us but other people pick other places but do you see spots where using multiple clouds does actually improve resilience in some way or is that dr myth a myth do you see that multiple clouds actually fix my resilience in some settings um i can pretty much guarantee you that if what resilience is what you're going after you'll have more outages by having more clouds than you will by just sticking to one <laughs> There are legit reasons, but most of them are business reasons, as far as I can tell. Um, but DR, like, how often does Google Cloud go down? <laughs> right? Uh, most people can afford a couple minutes a year, right? Which is basically what you're going to get from from the top three clouds. Um, and if, if you want to double your engineering time to try and set that up, well, th now you have three problems, right? You have AWS, you have Google, and you have all of that connective tissue between them, right? So. I don't think it's a good play for resiliency, although anytime in software you, you say never or always, you're going to be wrong for some outlier case. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Uh, I will ask you, though, when, so when I'm thinking about an operational approach, or you're giving someone advice and they are figuring out, all right, I'm using infrastructure in lots of places. Again, it could be on-prem and cloud, different places. Do you recommend that I kind of treat each environment as a silo from a logs and metrics perspective and just data? Do I si do I collect it all together for centralization? Should I use one tool chain for my work? How do you look at when I've got increasingly distributed infrastructure? How should I tackle ops? <laughs> God, that's a complicated question. And it's not the kind of question I could answer without asking a lot more questions. But philosophically, you, you always want there to be one place that you can look for everything. Um, philosophically, you don't want to have to be going this, this paging thing to that paging thing to that paging thing. And, you know, because infrastructures, you know, they have ripple effects. You never want to be getting paged by, you know, bun a bunch of different systems about one problem. Um, philosophically, you always want them to, to trickle up to one place. And one of the best ways to do that is using SLOs. Um, you know, if you're using SLOs, then you can usually ditch a lot of the paging on symptoms, paging on, you know, patterns or error spikes here and there, which which are going to be constant when you're at that level. You you just, you know, your system is never up. <laughs> it's just got pathologies all the way down, but we managed to run anyway, right? It's not about making sure it doesn't go down. It's about making sure that customers aren't affected when we do. There's always a bit of a tug of war though, though, between optimizing locally and optimizing globally. Because sometimes, you know, 
the global answer for a local solution sucks. <laughs> and the engineers who are working on it know it sucks, right? And so you kind of got to bridge that gap by surfacing whatever you can to the global solution while trying to make it better for the engineers who are working on the local solution to actually do things when, when things break. And, and I, I think that there are some interesting ways you can kind of partition this up, you know, because you don't want people who work on service over here and service over here that aren't really linked in any way to get paid at the same time, even if they share a backend or something. So the, the dream is always that you can start it with an SLO, start at the top, slice and dice, figure out what the dependencies are, and then maybe branch off into, okay, here are the local systems for, because you, you can't, for example, if you're just having the one, one logs to rule them all, you can never store like, all of the output of a TCP dump for your low-level systems or all of the output for, you know, print everything or, or a debug app. Like, you just, it's too much. But there are maybe lower-level tiers where you can gather more fidelity and more detail so that the engineers who get, get alerted and it's routed to them, they can dig in deeper. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Well, this has been awesome. I, uh, I got smarter on observability and, and just cloud operations thanks to these few minutes together. I really appreciate you taking a few minutes with us. This was super fun. Thank you.